um, get access to the recording for this as well. So anyone that's here today will get access to that or if they weren't available today as well. Um, all right, well, um, just let someone else in. Wait a second. Good morning. So um, just to start off with, yeah, today's session, because we had smaller numbers, we've decided to um, make it more in a meeting format rather than the webinar, um, because we, we're gonna ask you a couple of questions. You don't have to know the answer. It's more about making it a bit more fun and interactive, so it's not just two hours of David and myself talking. Um, but in the meantime, you're welcome to um, have your phones or um, cameras on mute or microphones on mute and you don't have to have your camera on but it's up to you. Um, some people prefer to have that on but some people have full days of Zooms and it gets exhausting <laughs> looking at yourself in the screen or um, all day. We definitely have a bit of Zoom fatigue ourselves in our organisation at times. So um, just to let you know that's the format and when we say um, interactive it's um you don't have to have the answers it's also more about an opportunity for you to ask us questions and um, utilize the time you've got with us here today so we have two hours scheduled it may not go for the full two hours sometimes our sessions don't if we've covered everything and there aren't any questions um, but we have allowed that so i'll just let another person in wait a second Hi Kylie, how are you? Just connect into audio. Louisa, did you have your hand up for something? Yeah, I, I accidentally, but I fixed the sound, so all is good. Thank oh, you. Okay, great. No worries. <laughs> Thank you. Hi Kylie, um, how are you? I'm good. I'm sorry. I just had a trouble with the. Northern Territory, South Australian time difference. So I'm here yeah. now. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Um, I was just saying to everyone, you're welcome to have your camera off or and your microphone on mute, but you can leave your camera on. We're going to make it um, interactive in parts of it, but also Dave and I will be doing a bit of talking as well. So um, yeah, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for um, our session, the volunteers first day induction and orientation um, and we are going to be talking about why it's a good way to start off on the best foot when you're involving volunteers into your organisation um, and we'll be identifying what is induction, what's orientation and what you need to include in that process um, when you're involving volunteers. So firstly, um, Volunteering SA and NT acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout Australia on which we're, meeting, which we're meeting today. And we recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders both past, present and also emerging. So, my name's Emily Zesses. I'm normally the Client Relationships Manager here at Volunteering SA and NT, but I'm acting in the role of Executive Manager for the Northern Territory at the moment. And David, I'll let you introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody. I'm David Jacker, also at Volunteering SA and NT. I'm the CHSP SSD coordinator, which means the Commonwealth Home Support Program, uh, Sector Support and Development, in other words, aged care services. Um, and I work with agencies and um, volunteers as well, and I also coordinate our mentor services program. And by the way, I'm having um, some extreme problems this morning with my technology. So please let me know if I cut out and I can repeat things or perhaps Emily can relay the information. Thank you. Absolutely. So if at any point you notice that David isn't on the camera, that's to just um, help with um, the internet because we have had some technical difficulties this morning. But the show must go on in this world we're living in of COVID and Zoom. So um Excellent. So um, what I'll encourage everyone to do, if at any point you have any questions or anything arises, um, feel free to use the chat box down the bottom. Um, absolutely welcome to. Um, if we don't have the answer, we will take that with us and get back to you. 
um, we will have an opportunity for you to ask questions. And we've also brought along some questions that we often get asked in the sector as well about um, induction and orientation and some of the key things when it comes to volunteers. Great, so what we thought, if people are happy to, and if you can, because it's such a small um, group, we thought we might do a quick whip around the, the virtual room. And if you're happy to say your name, what organisation you work for, your role, and what your, why you've joined us today and what you might be hoping to get out of today's session, if that's okay. Um, if you can't use a microphone or anything, um, I encourage you to use the chat box at the bottom. So um, that would be great. So, Glenis, we might start with you, if that's okay. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. I'm Glenis. I'm the manager here at the Moonta Tourist Office, um, which is a branch of the National Trust South Australia. Um, our organisation has over 100 volunteers. So that's our, um, we have a volunteer workforce over our six venues. Um, we're probably one of the largest um, National Trust branches in South Australia. And the reason I'm here today is we really haven't had in the past any formalities around managing volunteers. So we're looking to volunteering SA and I know our head office in um, Adelaide is working closely. So that's one. Absolutely. Um, yeah, great. Thanks, Glennis. I know that Tracy Fox has been doing a lot of work with you guys. So excellent. Mm -hmm. And most certainly we can help people with formalising a lot of those procedures and policies when it comes to VIO. Louisa. Oh, you're on mute, I think, Louisa, is it? Oh, no, it's not, but there's no sound. You can hear us. No one else can hear Louisa, can they? Oh, um, perhaps try the chat box for now. You, we could hear you before. While, while Louise is typing that, um, and then we'll be able to read in the chat box, um, Belinda, would you like to share as well? Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> uh, I'm Belinda McCulley, and I'm actually volunteering NT's new representative for Central Australia. So I'm based in Alice Springs and uh, supporting volunteer organisations in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek. If there's anyone on from those areas, be good to say hi. And um, I'm new to the role, so it's a really great opportunity for me to be part of this webinar too. So thanks, Emily. Thanks, Belinda. <laughs> yeah, I strongly encourage anyone, even if you're based in the top end, if you've got any connections in Central Australia, to link in with Belinda for sure. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm not sure of your name, but it's got user on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's just on mute. <laughs> there we go. Hi, how, hi everyone. Hello. Uh, my name's Jan Day. I am working with the Catalyst Foundation here in South Australia. I am very new to the role and very new to volunteer coordinating. I have a um, history in administration and managing life members of a football league, etc. So I'm used to dealing with people. Um, but I am now working two days a week at the Catalyst Foundation as their volunteer coordinator in training. And uh, um, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to the role. It's been the last two and a half weeks, of course, part of it's been at home and they've given me some work to do, but it's a very slow intro to the world of volunteering. But I'm here today to obviously start engaging with like-minded people, so. Absolutely, great. Thanks Thank for joining us, Jan. Thank you. Kylie, over to you. Uh, morning. So my name is Kylie Cowan. I am the volunteer programs manager for Parks and Wildlife in the Northern Territory. So, um, yeah, I coordinate and um, manage all the volunteers at all of our national parks and reserves across the Territory. 
uh, but also our campground host program. So that's that's reasonably new compared to places like Western Australia and South Australia. So um, just really formalising some of our policies and procedures and things and bringing new sites on board all the time and making sure that we're meeting the national standards for volunteer engagement. So uh, that's been really good with volunteering NT. Um, yeah, we, uh, we've got our processes for campground hosting going pretty smoothly. Um, I, I've only been in the role for a year and unfortunately my first campground host season was cancelled. So I'm yet to see some of these things actually from where to go. Uh, and as for our general volunteers that come out to the many parks and reserves that we have, um, inductions have been very... Um, you know, ad hoc and very up to the ranges on the ground at that specific park. So I've been working to try and get some consistency around that and better record keeping of training and inductions that go on. So yeah, just here to sort of make sure that I'm doing the best that I can to support the ranges on the ground with their volunteers. Fantastic. Thanks, Kylie. Absolutely. That's what we'll be helping with today. So great. Um, so Louisa has introduced, Louisa, can you hear, try again? Hi, I can, I can hear oh, yeah, you. Yeah, perfect. Yep, go I, for it. Yes, now we now. <laughs> yeah, welcome to. Inter I don't know. I'm not touching anything. I, it's very intermittent. Yeah. Hi, no. everyone. Um, I, like I said, um, I work for the Courts Administration Authority. I'm the volunteer coordinator. Um, at the moment, our volunteers haven't come on board because of the whole COVID thing. Um, but um, hopefully, come early next year, they'll come back on board. Um, so we've got about. 35 to 40 volunteers who provide information to our um, court users that come through, um, directing them where they need to be. Um, so as part of the induction process, the, um, I sort of, we, I normally have like key um, uh, volunteers that do provide on the job sort of training and induction. Um, and that sort of seems to be working okay, as long as I have the same volunteer providing the training so it's sort of consistent and we have like a manual as part of the induction process so the reason of my uh, joining this uh, meeting today is just to see if we can improve that what other organizations do um, and you know and we need to deal with the whole confidentiality sort of um, aspects of the role as well so anyway hi everyone <laughs> thank you that's great Joe, I don't know if you're if you've been a oh excellent Joe. Joe's um just popped in the chat book um box as well. Um so I'll just read that out. Joe, the horticultural officer for the Territory Wildlife Park in Barry Springs. Oh awesome, Joe. I coordinate volunteering programs and school groups who help here at the park. I joined today to improve our induction process. So that's fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. Um Alex, are you on the line there? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you. I'll just try and get it. There we go. Right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, so I work for the City of Tea Tree Gully Council, and I've just started the volunteer coordinator role a week and a half ago. Oh, wow. Well, I was able to do one induction before we locked down again. So, um, yeah, I'd love to just join today and hear how other people go about it and, and yeah, get some advice and... Yeah, so thanks, Emily. Yeah, great, thanks, welcome, that's very new. So um, I should also say if anyone's interested, both in the Northern Territory and South Australia, we run um, and coordinate volunteer involvement um, network meetings for anyone that's managing or coordinating or working with volunteers. So um, please email me if you'd like to join um, any of those and we can get you on the right mailing list for that. So um, excellent, great, and Marissa. Are you on the line there, Marissa, or happy to use the chat box? Okay, Marissa as well. Um, the mic isn't working. Marissa works at the Murray Bridge Council as a volunteer programs officer and here today to see if they can also improve their induction process. So that's fantastic. Thanks, everyone. It's great for us to just have an understanding why everyone's here and hopefully we can work towards helping you achieve those things um, with your volunteer involvement so thank you appreciate that i know sometimes we sign up for webinars thinking we can just listen and hide and be able to type and write emails at the same time but i think it's great to be able to interact in an, in a time when it's a little bit challenging 
So today's session is going to focus on providing volunteers with a proper induction process, formalising it, and really this is a good way to show that your organisation's commitment to its volunteers. So it's the first impression a volunteer gets with your organisation, although in saying that, they really do get that first impression from the minute they make contact with your organisation. So we always say, um, when you, if you're advertising or recruiting for volunteers, it's about how you respond to them in a timely manner and how you communicate with them. And that's the first impression they will get. So you're wanting to make sure that's very positive. Um, so this, um, this session will help identify what's key in making sure the induction and orientation are a positive experience for both the volunteer, but also for you as an organisation. Um, and I think a couple of you have already hit the nail on the head and um, consistency um, is being one of the key things as well. So in all of our sessions at Volunteering SANNT, we like to connect everything back to the national standards for volunteer involvement. Now, if you haven't heard of the national standards, you can access them via our website. Um, and we will, I'll let you know now, everything we share or discuss as a resource today, we will email that to you. So you'll get an email from Paola um, with all those resources. So we can put a link to the national standards in there. So these really are our best practice guide for um, making sure volunteer involvement is a positive experience for everyone involved. So today's session really connects with standard five, which is around support and development. And this is where volunteers understand their roles and gain the knowledge, skills and feedback needed to safely and effectively carry out their duties. So standard five is the one we connect in with. And the standard, the, um, the dot points under standard five are volunteers are provided with orientation relevant to their role and responsibility and volunteers' knowledge and skills are reviewed to identify support and development needs. And volunteers' knowledge and skills, skill needs relevant to their roles are identified and training and development opportunities are provided to meet these needs. And then 5.4 is around volunteers are provided with supervision and support that enables them to undertake their roles and responsibilities. This session also really does connect in with standard six. Um, standard six is around workplace safety. And so workplace safety focuses on the health, well, workplace safety and wellbeing. The health, safety and wellbeing of volunteers is protected in the workplace. So effective working relationships with employees and between volunteers are facilitated by the organisation. And I'll be talking about that in terms of orientation. Processes are in place to protect the health and safety of volunteers in their capacity as volunteers. And volunteers have access to complaints and grievance procedures. So these really are the things that you know you need to critically cover when it comes to induction and orientation. So the standards is always something we encourage you to refer back to. So volunteer induction and the checklist and what we'll talk about today is a way of meeting this criteria. You know, and it's really important that volunteers are supported with appropriate training, coordination and management where appropriate. So I'm now going to hand over to David, who's just going to take you through a little activity. Um, David, I'll hand it over to you now, which might just be via microphone. Thanks, Emily. Um, Hopefully you can see me, but uh, if you have any problem hearing me, let us know, please. Um, we thought we'd start with a little interactive exercise just to get everybody thinking about um, that first day. And so if you could write in the chat box five things that volunteers would do with you or at their first day at your organisation, just five things that you think are really important that volunteers would do. And we're going to look at those a little bit later, but we'll give you one or two minutes just to have a think about that. And I'll put the, um, that title, that question in the box. Five things that everyone would do on their first day.
Okay, how's everyone going with that? Excellent. So we've got introduced to everyone. We've got, oh, David, did you want to read them out? I'll let you read them. Or we'll come back to that. Yeah, if we could come back to that after we've chatted a bit more about induction and orientation, that would be good. No worries. Yeah, some great comments already. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you. So I just want to start out by talking about what is induction and orientation and, and what's the difference. So induction is where um, it's a good way to show your organisation's commitment, as I've already mentioned. It's the welcoming of new volunteers to your organisation and familiarising them with the role, the role of other workers, and that may involve um, paid workers or other volunteers as well and the workplace more broadly in the organisation. So the vision, mission and goals of what the organisation is trying to achieve. All volunteers should complete the induction process before starting any volunteering duties. And after completing induction, volunteers really should know where to access things like your organisation's policies and procedures, have a copy of these, you know, it might, for some volunteers, it might be in hard copy or it might also be in, um, like, on the computer or through, like, your internet or whatever it might be. Um, they also need to know, um, I guess, you know, what it is their role's doing and how it does connect back to what the organisation is trying to achieve. So it really is critical um, and, you know, not unlike what we do for paid staff, it's really important. On, Induction sets the tone, outlines the boundaries um, to prevent any issues that may occur down the track as well. So orientation is a bit more about actually physically um, taking people around um, and introducing people to other people within the workplace. Um, I'll go into a bit more of that um, as well. But this is where you... you with orientation, it's around orientation to the role, but also to the organisation. So induction, we talk about lists and policies and procedures, but orientation is actually that process of becoming really familiar with the role and learning what they need to know to be able to carry out those duties effectively and safely, um, and that it's an enjoyable experience. So what are some of the advantages or why, why is it important to have a structured orientation program and an induction process? So exactly when um, Kylie was talking before about consistency. So imagine if you weren't in the role. For some of us in our roles, we know we do this on a daily basis and we know what we're doing. But if you were to sort of up and leave or move on and there wasn't any paperwork, there wasn't a policy and procedure in place, um, and someone came on board, it means that it could be all up in the air and it could be a very much a bit of a shambles in that someone's trying to work out how to do this. It also means really that with um, having it structured, there's that consistency across organisations. So we know for a lot of you, um, you might be one volunteer manager, but you actually might not necessarily be supervising volunteers on a daily basis either. You might be um, based in a head office or um, coordinating from somewhere and that you actually have different supervisors or team leaders who oversee the role of the volunteer on a daily basis. But if you know that they've been inducted wholly and consistently, consistently for the organisation, you know that everybody's been equipped with the same information, the same knowledge, and that means it's fair and equitable for all volunteers. That some people, you know, we hear volunteers say, well, I didn't even get an induction. I don't, you know, I, did, I just got told to go out the back and start working in the shop or, and they don't actually know where they can access their policies and procedures or what rights and responsibilities they have as a volunteer. So it really is important to have it documented, to have people sign off on these processes um, so that your organisation um, is covered, but also so the volunteer feels safe and reassured to be involved in your organisation. So it helps new volunteers learn about your organisation, your missions and goals, and it may instruct the volunteer, as I said, on policies and procedures. It also increases confidence for people. So it can make future volunteers feel more comfortable with your organisation um, and understanding of what their role does and what the organisation does. 
And, it, you know, we often hear from volunteers that they really appreciate and like to know how their role, whatever it may be, contributes to that overall bigger picture of what the organisation's setting out to achieve. So it reminds them of their purpose. It also helps to increase enthusiasm. So it's an important part of maintaining the motivation and enthusiasm of why people have contacted your organisation. You know, when um, I'll talk shortly about who's responsible for induction, but whoever you might have um, that's presenting or doing parts of these processes, it can really help to continue and foster that culture of this is why we're a great place to volunteer at. And this is what we all, we're all here for the same journey and for the same purpose. Um, I think it really also reaffirms people's decisions to be connected with your organisation. If you're doing it properly, and we know that the biggest way to recruit more volunteers um, is actually around um, word of mouth. So word of mouth is the biggest, most consistent um, way to recruit volunteers. Um, and so if they know that from the beginning they have a really great experience and it's really positive, then they, um, you know, they're going to spread a positive word about your organisation. Welcome, Ricky. I'll just um, say hi. Um, we've done, we've just got started into what is orientation and induction. Um, do you just want to do a quick, um, we've done a quick name, organisation, and what you're hoping to get out of today. Then everyone's either happy to have their phone or mic uh, microphone or camera on or off. So microphone's mm -hmm. off, yes, but um, you can leave the camera on if you like. Okay, cool, no worries. So yes, I'm um, Ricky Lodesman. I'm from Good Shepherd, and I currently head up the um, the Nils Volunteer Project that we have been we started running there this year. Um, my background is more in uh, sort of recruiting traditionally, so volunteers is a new thing for me. Um, so I'm interested in learning anything in terms of um, ideas and ways in which to you know induct and support volunteers in their roles because it is very different to obviously paid staff and in how we actually do the inductions and stuff. So yeah, I'm just here to learn um, different ideas on how we're doing things and find ways that we can maybe improve on our current process. Great, excellent. Pretty similar to what everyone else is here for today as well by the sounds of it. Um, okay. And just so you know, in the chat box, David's asked everyone to just have a think about what are five of the things that a volunteer should um, or should happen with a volunteer on their first day of starting in the workplace? So there's, you'll see a bit of a chat and some lists in there. So feel free to add to that as well while you're listening. All right. So um, again, so what are other, some of the other advantages? So as I mentioned, um, it avoids future problems. So by explaining, and one of the biggest things you hear us at VSA and T um, talk about is role descriptions. So we we encourage every organisation has to have or should have a role description for volunteers. That by far um, sets the expectations, the boundaries, and people um, know what to expect of a volunteer. And also if there's ever issues with paid staff or volunteers asking a volunteer to go outside that role, they can actually say, well, that's within, that's not within my scope. So absolutely that sets the tone, but orientation and induction are really important in terms of giving the right information from the start. And then you'll, you save time and energy spent that could be, that end up coming up as questions or misunderstandings or misconceptions down the track. So there really is lots of benefits um, around why I have why to have a formalised induction and orientation process. So who is responsible for induction and orientation of volunteers in your organisation? So this is a great question and I think um, it's a really good one to talk about. So in our organisation, we may have a number of people involved in um, someone's orientation as a volunteer and induction. And, you know, often you need to decide who's going to be ultimately responsible for this. Um, it's always good to have one person that's leading the process. But, it, and it, you know, it generally might fall with you as the volunteer manager or the volunteer coordinator. Or in some larger organisations, it might also fall with your HR team, um, if you have one. Not a lot always have that, but sometimes it does. 
And so it can be split between a few people. And we talk about um, why that might be a great way to do it. So for example, you might have a office manager that, or an office coordinator or someone in administration that might actually talk through someone around the processes for um, things like answering the phone, logging on to computers, um, some of those admin tasks. However, you might actually even look at involving other volunteers in your volunteer programs to be part of it. And this is a really great opportunity to look at current and existing volunteers that maybe are showing or demonstrating some really great leadership skills. And, and they often feel really um, a sense of pride or um, excited to be asked to be part of that, that program and, and that involvement and that journey for someone to be, become a new volunteer. And then you yourself as a volunteer manager might um, then look at what some of the key things you need to induct them around specific to their role, but also the organisation. And I also think it's really important to involve um, as many people as you can within sort of that time. And I'll get a bit more into that around who they need to meet and greet. But, you know, I think this helps with making volunteers feel comfortable and making sure they're really valued as part of the workforce. So um, taking them around to meet people, you know, from the, you know, anywhere from the CEO to other volunteers, to reception, to part-time workers, making sure if you can, that they're included in the process. Um, you know, if it, it's good to have a person in charge to bring it all back and um, make sure that you get through the list. And I won't talk about the list because David's going to talk a bit about that, but, um, and delegating it out to others, but having sections that people can sign off on and make sure that it's um, all volunteers are hearing the same thing. Um, but definitely consider writing that into other volunteers role descriptions as part of their leadership in that they could be, involved in the process of inducting and orientating new volunteers into the organisation. Um, really, um, we hear positive feedback from volunteers when they get those opportunities and aren't always, um, like that they are involved in making decisions and consultation and, and being part of it. So yeah, really important, but I think it's really good to have one person that oversees the process, but ha I think, you know, go for it in terms of delegating out to other people and just making sure that's really clear and consistent. So I'm going to hand over to David now to talk more about what goes in the list and what that actually looks like. Thanks, Emily. And I'll probably, I'll do this without a video, I think, because I'm getting a better uh, quality without the video. Um, just on that first day, the importance of that first day, uh, a couple of volunteers uh, were recording little snippets for a podcast uh, um, a few weeks ago for us. And one of the things that they talked about as being a really positive experience was that first day, the induction, and how that set the, the scene for the whole of their volunteering. They understood the expectations, they knew about the organisation, um, and it, it just goes to show the power of that first day, you know, that you only get one chance at a first impression um, sort of cliche. Just reading through the comments in the chat box, fantastic. These are uh, a great comments. I'll just quickly read them out. Being introduced to everyone properly, um, a tour of the workplace, rundown on the work plan for the day. Um, Kylie says, shadowing the rangers in their duties. Again, being introduced, the tour of the workplace, uh, where things are, safety and security, the background information on the organization and their role. Um, physical things like desk, kitchen, toilets, that's part of the orientation. Meet staff and other volunteers and inducted to whichever site they're working to. There's a nice one that says, ask about animals we keep. They all love the animals. Ask how to get a job here. Meet other like-minded people, learn all about the park. Lovely. Um, so all of those things are important. And I just in my own head, I like to think of the induction as being the what and the how and the orientation as the who and the where, um, just as a general principle. But if you're like me, you love to have lists, you love to have checklists. And so probably all of those things would go on to a checklist, those things we've just talked about and quite a few others. And a little bit later, I'll show you a couple of samples of um, checklists, which you're welcome to um, have. We'll send them templates through to you. 
Um, another thing to consider might be having other volunteers working with you on the day, uh, that first day, to be the buddies for um, your new volunteers. Uh, they, you know, it's a great opportunity, I think Emily mentioned that, a great opportunity to involve other volunteers. And it doesn't have to stop at the induction day. Uh, they can be assigned as a buddy for, say, the first three months even, um, to help with them. Um, general uh, general introdu induction and a specific induction. So some of the things you have on your list will be for all volunteers that work in your organisation, that volunteer in your organisation, and other things will be specific to roles. And when we look at the lists again later, you'll see that there are some things that um, are quite specific. How much to get through in a day? <clears throat> um, we've been talking about induction as um, though it were one day, but of course you can have inductions over several days or over a whole week or a series of weeks. And particularly if you've got lots of policies and procedures, as we do at Volunteering SANT, for example, they don't necessarily have to see all those and read all those in one day. In fact, it'll probably be too much for them in one day. So we like to spread those things over. And it might be more appropriate to do the really fun, memorable things, uh, focus on those on the first day, like having lunch together, meeting the people in your organisation, and then a little bit of paperwork, some necessary paperwork. Perhaps there are a few policies and procedures that need to be addressed straight away. Um, a summary or, or a get together at the end of the day with the volunteers is really important. So not just left hanging after the induction, everybody, if you're doing it um, as a group, come back together and talk as a group and summarize what's happened during the day. And that's a good opportunity to sign off on those policies and procedures that they might've read during the day. And some of those policies might be privacy, confidentiality, the volunteer involvement policy, for example. So you think about the um, how you're going to do it in terms of is it going to be all one day, is it going to be over a series of days, and then putting together a checklist uh, that you will um, fill out during the day and in the coming weeks that you will file away in your records and the volunteer will get a copy of. All right, so as I mentioned, I'll show you some of those um, templates later, but Emily will take the next section about orientation. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, David. And that's a really important point to reiterate that it doesn't all have to take place in the first day. Um, we don't have to put that pressure on anyone. It's not always achievable and it's too much. It's too much information and overwhelming. Um, however, orientation in terms of meeting and greeting people on the first day is very important. So it's not all about the paperwork and lists. Um, you know, when I think when a volunteer arrives on their first day, I think it's really important that you um, show them a space. And so when we talk about a space for the volunteers, we've heard volunteers say that they didn't even have anywhere that they could put their handbag to feel safe, you know, while they were work volunteering in their role. So are they going to have a desk allocated to them? Um, or is it a hot desk? Um, sometimes you might be better off setting the scenario where you have hot desks rather than desks that become people's because you can get some ownership issues around that if there were ever to be changes. We have experienced that ourselves and now often turn them into hot desks to show that um, at times different people will work on that. But I think it's still really important to let someone know where they can keep their notebooks, um, their handbag or their, you know, their lunchbox, whatever it might be, is safe. So you want to you want to start by doing that when they arrive on the day. I think you you know you obviously want to do things like your toilets, your tea and coffee making, your fridge for them to put their lunch, um, and definitely talk through your emergency evacuation procedures when it comes to that. Um, on the first day. And then I think it's really important to actually take them around to start to meet people. And one of the things that's always worth doing in the lead up um, to a new volunteer starting, and now when we talk about this, we, we are talking, um, there might be times that you're doing an individual orientation and induction, but you might actually have times where it's um, more effective to do a group orientation and induction. So send out an email to let all the workplace know, you know, guys, we're really excited this week. Um, we've got um, Joe Smith joining us to um, come on board as a volunteer 
in this program or in this um, organisation and what their role will be so that, so that people don't sort of get there on that day and think, oh, who's this person? I think it really helps to set the scene. So keep that in mind going forward. So take them around and start introducing to people. Um, you know, find the key people they need to perhaps meet with that day. And hopefully prior to um, them starting, you may have teed up and locked in, as I talked about, that they're gonna need to, or the induction process is gonna involve a few other people. Hopefully you've been able to manage and book in some times that day or that week or the ongoing weeks with people as well. So I think planning enough that you're not suddenly rushing a volunteer to get involved in your program where they where you haven't been able to inform the rest of the workforce or book those times for someone to meet with is really important um i think what we try to do is we take people around to meet everyone in the office that day um and knock on doors um and let them know and um really it's you know just builds that inclusive workforce that everyone's part of the bigger team part of the family and you're here to be involved and we're excited to have you on board as a volunteer. So if, for example, you were looking at doing a group orientation and induction, what you might actually do is you might need to book a room um, within your organisation um, and you might need to think about um, who you might then invite in to come and introduce your, themselves to the group. And I always think wherever possible, if you can, if you're doing regular group inductions or it's part of what your organisation does, get the CEO in there. It makes, it shows your commitment to volunteer involvement from the top. It makes a really lasting impact. Um, and I think it's really important for the CEO to be involved in that. If the CEO is not available, someone's senior in leadership to really welcome the team on board um, and really show that value. But Again, you know, every workforce member is important in the organisation to be introduced to and also for the volunteers to know where they need to go for help if they have any questions that arise. I should highlight now as well, actually, that we at today's session, we are talking a lot about, um, well, obviously we're talking about induction and orientation, but basing it on our... Um, previous experiences prior to COVID. So I do want to acknowledge that we will talk about um, what does it look like now in a COVID-19 world and, and how to go about some of these things um, when we're talking about online and what that means going forward for volunteering as well. So I do just want to acknowledge that. Um, but again, you know, if you were setting up, say, a group Zoom as part of an induction process, there's no reason you couldn't then invite all those other people to join via Zoom as well. So um, a lot of what we do in face-to-face -face can be mimicked um, into the virtual world, but we will talk a bit later about what happens to people that are volunteers who don't access or have access to technology and how can we still include them in our organisations. Um, so as mentioned, you might have some informal chats with people around on the first day, but also those scheduled important catch-ups to cover the roles or, you know, the details of the role and what's relevant to them. Um, and I think you need to have a clear plan. So I think, you know, we talk about the induction list, but having even, sometimes it can be really handy to give a volunteer a bit of an agenda for the day so they know not to feel a bit overwhelmed, that they can see, okay, this is meet and greet. I can have lunch and relax and do some reading in this time and some, for, you know, forms and complete some of the important bits and pieces. So that also helps someone to know what they're coming into. Um, and that might be something that you choose to send to them prior to the day as well via email and whatnot. Um, it is overwhelming. It's a lot of information um, and meeting lots of people. And so I guess, again, just encouraging people to wear name badges in your organisation. I know we all get fairly complacent with that, but when you're new, and as, as some of you mentioned, um, you might have hundreds of volunteers and different people on different days. And so not everyone is able to be introduced to everyone um, and won't necessarily know everyone. So try and encourage that um, name badge, you know, and people that aren't there on that day, if they then see volunteers that are new, to go up and introduce themselves on the days that they might come across that volunteer. Because um, otherwise, you know, sometimes 
even in our organisation, you come in and you're like, oh, that's right, I saw an email that um, Jane's starting today, so I'm going to make sure I make an effort to go up and introduce myself to Jane. So just a couple of those things that are um, really critical to set the scene from the beginning. Um, and then also showing people their workspace where other people sit, so they know where they can continue to go. If um, they go, oh, that's right, I need Sue in marketing, I can go down to that desk down there and talk to her. So um, it's really about the people, and like David said, it's the it's sort of the um, the who and the where, and showing them where they can access everything, photocopiers, printers, um, where those uh, policies and procedures will be located physically if they need to access access them in a hard copy, um, and whatever else it might be, like first aid kits, um, the evacuation plan as mentioned. Even letting them know a bit about where can you grab lunch and where's a good place to get a coffee and things like that around the place, all really important. Um, you might even have some organisations have different coffee machine systems, different chocolate box systems, which are always a bit dangerous if you ask me. But um, yeah, all those sorts of, they might seem like little things, but I think the more you share with a volunteer um, early on, the more they feel part of the team. Okay, um, back over to you, David, now to talk a bit more about some of the formal side of things. Thanks, Emily. Um, I mentioned before I was going to show a, a couple of sample checklists, so I'm going to do that now. I'm going to use the screen share uh, function for that. And again, please let me know if you uh, can't hear me properly. So I'll just take a minute to do that. The first one is a sample induction checklist. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Okay. And I can move it around. Terrific. For me, working with checklists, I like them to be as simple and as clean and clear as possible and are not too much um, in the um, way of wording. So I um, construct something that is just headings really and a, a space to check them. And I've also got here prior to interview, after interview, after selection, prior to induction, at induction, just because there are some things that need to take place um, sequentially. So by the time a volunteer arrives for their induction day for their first day, they probably will have seen the position description. Hopefully they've seen that. They may have uh, submitted a resume to you and they may have filled in an application form. Then there's an interview, assuming they're coming on board as a volunteer, getting their badge or organised and getting the record organised, completing reference checks, screening checks, timesheet. We've got a new little addition to our induction list this year, a COVID safe plan and explaining how that works. And that of course is really important. And that would maybe prior to the induction day so that when volunteers arrive, they're feeling safe and comfortable about working in the organization. And it may, may also include something about working from home or working virtually. As I said before, we'll give you a copy of this at the, um, after the training. These are in alphabetical order, so they're not in sequential order at this point. And we would just work our way through those that are induction. It may not be all in one day. I'll just give you a minute to look at that. They may have their police check, um, their clearance to show you on that day for you to cite and record the details. And you can see there that some of the policy and procedures are in that induction, that first part of the induction, and some are after the induction. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. We use an acknowledgement form that the volunteer can uh, tick off as they read policies and procedures, and they will do some of those on the day and then some of those after as, as part of that.
And this checklist can be um, copied once it's finished and given to the volunteer so they know that they have completed everything on the checklist and another copy can go into your records, scanned or um, filed as a hard copy. Okay, I'll open up a different checklist just as a comparison. Could I ask just a quick question, is that can... okay? Of course. So um, one thing that um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm finding a little bit of a challenge in terms of the recruitment of volunteers, etc., is the, um, the mandatory check requirements. So at the moment, I'm recruiting for about 23 different providers. So the idea is I do the front end work, get them all trained, ready to rock. And then I place them in with our providers. And the, um, I guess the challenge or the blockage or barriers that I'm facing at the moment is that um, they're wanting to go take their, our volunteers back through their recruitment process. And we're trying to explain to them that we've already done that. Um, but in order to do that, I'm having to do quite a lot of checks. And there seems to be a bit of discrepancy in terms of what are the, I guess, basic requirements for volunteers in South Australia in terms of mandatory checking. So, for example, at the moment we're doing, a, we do a police check. I'm doing all the DCSI checks, plus I'm doing two to three references on them. So that's quite a, um, quite a long process, as you can imagine, especially when a lot of the time I'm doing this remotely at the moment because of all the lockdown stuff. But then I've had information um, that police checks um, don't really need to be done because the DCSI working with children track is quite, you know, covers a lot of stuff. So therefore it's not really relevant. Um, and yeah, if I'm doing a working with children trek, I shouldn't have to do all the other DCSI checks because that's the most complex and involved check there is. So therefore by doing that, I'm actually covering all those other areas. So I'm just wondering if you guys can give me, um, I guess your take or interpretation of what is or isn't required for volunteers because I'm actually losing volunteers because my process is taking so long. Um, so I just happy to answer that. Um, so this is a common question. Well, it's probably not as common now, but it used to be until um, things became a bit clearer with um, DHS. So what you need to remember, and we won't spend too much time, and I'm happy to take this offline with you, Ricky, and do some yep. chatting with you about this. Um, yep. That um, you need to ultimately, when it comes to screening in South Australia, it's different in the Northern Territory, so that's why I won't spend as much time on it, but um, you need to go, what does your funding body ask of you to do? What is legislation? Mm -hmm. So if they are working with children, then yes, you know, they're a prescribed position and they need to. Um, mm -hmm. That's really important. Um, and then the other thing that we like to reiterate is there's no need to overscreen. So if you're, you, they may not, what's, I know that they say like they're all free, let's do it, but it actually takes the DHS department time and it's still resources to go through every single check because it's not the same. So if they're not working with people with disability and they're not working with aged care, like in the aged care, then it's not relevant to do those checks. I'll talk to you a bit about, I can talk offline with say Paul and, this, um, and some people even out there still trying to get their head around it. I guess what we talk about is say for example, um, and there's a chart that really does explain and it breaks down um, who, what is in each check so you can go back and refer to that and what's included yeah um and we um encourage people to have a look at that and i can send you the link but um the reason some organizations may still need to do things like a police check as well um so for example in south australia now it's mandate that anyone working with children has to have the working with children check so a mm -hmm. police check is not suffice um but for example, if they are a bus driver and they are going to be driving a group of young children. Now, this is my take on it and I've done a lot of work with Sarah, but we're, who's um, from the Department of Human Services, but we have been back in touch with her because I know this question came up in another network meeting. 
Mm -hmm. um, and we're just getting that clarity. But the reason people may have still been doing the safe hole check is, for example, the safe hole check will then give you the information about if there's been any driving in incidents. So the working with children check will look at the role in terms of children and their involvement and if there's been any... Um, um, offences or anything like that but um, in terms of the police check that will give you the traffic and um, driving incidents so Dave mm. do you want to add anything to that? No that's that's very comprehensive Emily and yeah always thinking in those three terms the legislation and compliance for funding requirements and then the organisational requirements I think is a good place to start and then Yes, thinking about the role very, very carefully about where the interactions are and, um, again, if it's a funded service, uh, that has its own implications. That's right. I guess, I guess your example is, um, is a great one for something that's very black and white, but my issue is it's very grey. Um, you know, so it's like how, and that's my biggest battle now. But if this isn't relevant to today, that's fine, Emily. We can yeah. we can set up a separate link. I thought it was yeah. about this, so but that's all right. I can we can do up a separate chat because this is something that's really causing a lot of problems. So I definitely am looking for some solid advice or links or references that I can use to try and talk with our providers to get some better clarity around this because yeah. um, it's a massive barrier right now. Oh, okay, yeah, absolutely. No, we'll take it offline because we David and I discussed. Um, screening um, but we what we've discussed and we see that screening is actually before induction and orientation so you would have done all that to then work out if they're suitable for the role this is more about their first Absolutely. day so I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll email you this afternoon Ricky because then it's, okay that'd be great thank you definitely so thank you but yeah it does it comes up as an issue for people but we're always happy to we don't always know the answers, but we're here to talk through people. And again, you know, we reiterate how important screening is. Um, we yeah. understand some of those issues um, do come up for people and we don't want that to be a barrier for people yeah. Um, for yeah. more involvement. But we, there is definitely um, ways that it is more simplified. So we'll look at that. In terms of if you ever in that situation where you are recruiting volunteers and... Um, on behalf of other organisations and then they're looking to do their own induction and orientation, that really is, there's parts of it that would definitely have to happen in terms of orientation to the role in their organisation, but we would encourage an organisation not to be rehashing any information that might have been already covered, um, as I think it's really important that we make the process, whilst we need to cover these things and it is really important, we don't want to add any additional and overwhelm volunteers too much. Sorry, back to you, David. Yep, thanks, Emily, and thanks, Ricky, for that. Uh, I'll just go and just share a, another sample checklist. This one comes from Justice Connect and I just put it into a table today, but it's, again, it's very simple. Well, it has some uh, directions and text rather than just headings. Um, but very similar kinds of things and obviously specific to certain roles, like not every volunteer has a workstation, but that may be appropriate. Um, one thing I didn't mention. Busy. Oh, sorry about that. Um, one of the things I didn't mention oh. was the, um, the role description. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of cross talk there. I think someone's not on mute, perhaps. <laughs> um, yeah, talking about the volunteer role description, expectations and, and reporting structure. So that's something that can be uh, talked about. And particularly if you've got volunteers who are all in a similar role. And that's one of the things we, we could talk about too, is uh, whether you have similar roles on one particular day or whether you're going to have a general induction and then take volunteers uh, in groups to talk about specific roles. I didn't mention the consent form and release, so if uh, that's for media, I assume, the media consent form and release form. And another thing I didn't mention before too was, uh, Emily did touch on it, was who is the key contact person for the volunteer? So many times if HR are conducting the induction, that may not be the people that they the volunteers go to on a regular basis and who are, who are supervising them. 
and again some policy. So I'll we'll include that in the um, package of templates. Okay, so got a great checklist doing the induction, but there are many policies and procedures. You're not going to get through them all in one day, probably. How do you get around that? One of the things that we do is to create an acknowledgement form that's specifically about policies and procedures. So I'll show you that. It's a separate form that we give on induction day. Now, don't be overawed by the list of policies in here because we've included just about everything that could be useful. But the idea is we set some key ones that are looked at on induction day and you probably want to discuss them with the volunteers as well so they everybody understands them and then we could give them a, an acknowledgement form and say over the next couple of weeks say could you please have a look at these policies and tick them off um, as you have looked at them and understand them it's quite a comprehensive list here And I doubt that you would have all of them for any particular volunteer. You just use the ones that are necessary. And then a space to sign off at the end. Copy to the volunteer and copy for volunteer records. Either hard copy or scan. Any questions about the acknowledgement or the induction checklist before I move on? Okay, so obviously uh, where you record all of this information, what has been achieved on induction day, which policies and procedures have been looked at, and which ones are still to be looked at, where do you keep a record of that? Perhaps you have an HR department in your organisation who does all the recording and does all of that as we do. Or maybe it's up to the volunteer coordinator if that's you. Or maybe it's up to the supervisors of the volunteers to record that information. Now, before we started using our HRIS, the Human Resource Info Management System, um, I used a spreadsheet, for example, for volunteers. And I'll just very quickly, I'm sure you're <laughs> very good, familiar with spreadsheets and how to record things, but just some of the kinds of things could match the induction checklist and the policy checklist. which is a very simple one with contact details, date of birth, how would they like to be recognised for their birthday, emergency contacts, important to have access to those, when they were interviewed, who were the referee checks, when were they completed and who by. We talked about screening, what type of screening has been um, used. When there's an sub application submitted, when you've got the um, results of that, recording the screen check number. Has the policy and procedure acknowledgement form been completed? What's the status for 2020? I think that's really important, particularly with um, COVID. Perhaps some volunteers have decided to suspend their volunteering temporarily. Um, each year we get them to fill in an update. So we've got accurate information for emergency um, contacts and their own contact information. And then just general notes about their availability over the year. And you can add columns to that. And we'll include this again in the uh, templates and you can add or delete if you wish. One thing to remember um, is there is a danger with too many spreadsheets. When individual line managers all have their own recording spreadsheets and I don't know whether you want to add anything to this Emily but it can be really confusing and information can get lost or misplaced. Um, absolutely. And some organisations go down the path of using things like Better Impact or Vera, which are actually um, 
management systems that you can purchase. Um, they, often it's bigger organisations with bigger budgets that might use um, those sorts of products to be able to capture all this information. But I think um, I noticed I've, earlier this year, I did a gap assessment with an organisation who was purely volunteer run. And they said one individual had the spreadsheet for all of this. And I talked to them about, so if this one individual suddenly becomes unavailable, where does anyone else have this information? Where is it stored? Is there hard copies in locked filing cabinets? Um, and we actually talk to them about, you know, think about setting up a Google Docs so that there's multiple people that could access it if need be, but remembering confidentiality in that process. But I think there is, yeah, be careful not to have too many spreadsheets, but making sure that um, other people can access it. But if it is located on somewhere like your central drive that people can access, you may need to think about making it password protected. Um, and anything like that so that you do respect privacy and confidentiality as well. Um, but yes, be, be mindful of making sure people can access it other than just one person. If, and if different supervisors are in charge on each day and need to access those um, contact details and emergency details, then we want them to be able to. So yeah, thanks David. Anything else? Yes, and, and definitely the privacy issue is really important and you know, super important for screening information or contact details, so um, be really careful. I think you know, our preference would probably be for something like Better Impact or a system that can um, do all of those features um, as opposed to a spreadsheet, but not everybody has the facility or the, no, the funds to do that, so have to arrange something um, like the spreadsheet, perhaps um, yeah, sharing on a hard drive um, with appropriate uh, passwords and so on. Okay, well that's uh, that's it for my section there, Emily. If you wanted to, great. Uh, Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about training um, as part of the orientation process. So, can I ask you all to use the chat box to just list? Five areas that you might provide training for volunteers, um, not on the first day, obviously, because that it would just be way too much, but what are some of the five cri critical um, training areas that you would perhaps do in your organisation? You may not have five, you may have two or three, um, but if everyone's happy to just type that and type it to everyone in the chat box, that would be great. I'll give you a couple of minutes for that. Just have a think about what you do perhaps provide in terms of training. Yeah, role specific training. Thanks, Ricky. Confidentiality. Great, yeah, child safe environment, food handling, hazard incident management, first aid, conflict management, great. Yeah, excellent, using pre-placement training about the park for campground hosts, manual handling, cultural sensitivity, excellent. How to deal with difficult users, yes, great. Horticulture, plant identification, sensitive conversations, fantastic. Great, thank you everyone. So it looks like a lot of people do um, provide training sessions for your um, volunteers. And I guess there's a few things that you really need to consider when determining what training you need to have available and provide. And so we talk about a couple of key things. So as mentioned, in, even in um, relation to the screening, what is legislated for your organisation and what training do you need to have? So for example, child safe environments. What is your funding agreements require that the training that volunteers have? And what other compliance issues are there that you may need to make sure that you're ticking boxes and um, doing everything correctly? Then what is specific to the role and then what is specific to the organisation as well? And so training, um, I've had an organisation contact me recently saying, you know, training's costing us a lot. Um, 
you know, what, you know, how can we minimise the training costs? Well, I see that you need to look at it as an investment. If you invest in your volunteers and you provide the right training, you set people up with clear expectations, knowledge on how to successfully do the role, you really are minimising, again, any issues down the track. And now, you, have, you know, we think as an individual, wouldn't we want to go somewhere where we know we're supported to be in a really safe environment and we're taught how to do things properly? So I think it's really important that we consider um, that while sometimes it may seem like um, there can be some expenses involved with it, what can you do internally and in-house What's out there that's free that you can tap into throughout, um, you know, different places like community centres, different government departments, local councils often offer training for people in their community. Um, you know, subscribing yourself to a few different newsletters to be able to access that information might be useful um, and look at ways of minimising those costs. But I think we really need to look at training as critical in um, best practice of volunteer involvement. And, and you'll see that that's it's always part of the national standards as well. So um, we talk about those things around compliance with your funding, with legislation, and then what is needed for the, for the role specific, but also the organisation specific training as well. Um, and David's mentioned, you know, infection control and COVID safe training, which is very relevant um, at the moment, and I know David knows a little bit more about that infection control training, which, David, did you want to mention anything about that as well? Um, there is a, a, a site which is, um, has all of the training on it, and it, I think it took, um, well, it didn't take very long at all, and it's, a, it's basically reading through a set of slides and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, answering questions in a quiz format. But there's all sorts of information that you could give people as well um, on that induction day if they haven't received it already. Excellent, Thanks. yeah. And, and Ricky's made a good point too, that you can always look at funding available for training. And um, in South Australia, the government often looks at that. We recently had um, some grants through us that you could apply for training, for, uh, funding for training. So... You know, if your organisation can't always afford it, have a look at, you know, doing a grant application and seeing what you can access out there. But, you know, sometimes the training doesn't always have to be formal and bring in accredited trainers. Obviously, things like child safe environments, first aid, manual handling, etc. yes. But if it's role specific and it's looking at your organisation um, and even some of that stuff, you know, it's about you know, looking at what the organisation can do and, and how you can maybe, you know, that you've actually provided that information and put together a PowerPoint and run a session yourself. So it's definitely an investment. We also talk to organisations about if you're promote, like when you're looking to recruit volunteers, utilise the training as a promotion tool. So particularly if you're trying to attract younger volunteers and say, for example, uni students, TAFE students, or people looking to build their resume, then volunteering, uh, training in the volunteer role is actually great for their resume as well. So definitely use it as a promotion tool. And it also is, again, when I talk about word of mouth and when volunteers are gonna be your biggest advocate um, in promoting where they volunteer and it being a positive experience, you know, they're able to speak highly that they received a, a great training um, to prepare themselves for the role. So absolutely, it's, um, it's definitely a really critical part of the, um, the induction. And look at how you might be able to, some organisations have now moved to delivering some online sessions and running it through Zoom and then having some questions where you might tick off some boxes. Um, and you need to know that they've actually completed it. Um, you might look at doing some group sessions and some of it might be individual based. But um, there's often, and that's again why it's great joining a network because there's often those questions might come up and you can find out how other organisations have um, been able to adapt into a bit more of a virtual world if you're needing to do that as well. So um, really important and make sure it's included. And again, it doesn't need to take place in the first day. It might be something that's scattered over weeks or months um, because not everything can be done um, straight away. And I guess one thing I always like to reiterate um, is that volunteering or volunteers um, 
Just because you've done a training or an induction and orientation once, that doesn't mean that's where it ends. As we know, like learning is lifelong and ongoing um, and ever evolving and changing. And I think, you know, when you set the scene with new volunteers with the induction and orientation, talk to them about this is something that we'll look at reviewing and we will come back with um, and do it again in a couple of years. Because we've had volunteers even in our organisation come up and say to me, hey, Emily, like we didn't know some of these changes because we did our orientation and induction 10 years ago. Um, and we, if we've missed an email, they didn't necessarily know. So I think you need to look at re-induction and reorientation um, because it's really important that this always, you know, things change so much, policies and procedures, legislation changes, and we need to know people are doing things correctly. Um, and we need to actually make sure we're complying with what's expected of us as an organisation. So setting that tone and scene with your new volunteers and informing your current and ongoing volunteers that this is stuff that will be a continual process um, absolutely is important. So David, I'm gonna hand, up, hand back to you now to talk a bit about feedback and checking in. Thanks, Emily. Uh, so you've, uh, you've gone through your induction, your first day, your induction, and it's about to finish. One of the important things is to ask for feedback about how the day went. And it's best to do that, I think, on the day if you can, or very close to the day if that's not possible. I would recommend preparing some kind of evaluation sheet, not an arduous thing, because they've probably had enough paperwork for the day, but um, just some things that they could tick or a Leichhardt scale they can um, talk about. So what do you need to know from an evaluation? Well, things like, was it, you know, did the day feel too long? Did the day feel too short? Was there too much information? Could we have given more information? Um, was everything relevant, you think, or were there things that you had to listen to that, you know, wasn't really relevant to you? Um, did everyone seem friendly and inviting when um, you went around and, and did the orientation? Whichever sort of questions, and this will, again, it will feed back in and um, modify the process for next time. And another question could be, um, would you be prepared to help with an induction um, of other volunteers next time? After the induction, of course, we don't necessarily, well, some organisations may not have a lot of contact with all of the volunteers that they've inducted, but um, a review of the volunteers' performances can be a thing after a set period of time that's really very useful. And they don't generally have a, a formal probationary period, but it is a good idea to set a time frame following which you'll consider whether the volunteer arrangement is working out as expected. So if it's not working out, it's better for the organisation and probably the clients if it's addressed and if necessary, you end the arrangement. But in that particular um, uh, three month catch up, say, you could ask questions about the induction again and, and again, the questions about whether they would like to help with future inductions. Emily, do you have anything to add to the feedback? No, just remembering that um, support for volunteers should be ongoing. You know, as David said, it doesn't end um, after orientation and induction and really reinforcing where a volunteer can go if they're having issues at any point, you know, and what line of communication. Um, part of my role here at BSANT is I deal with volunteers experiencing really difficult times in their organisation. And I often go back to them um, because we can't always, um, at, well, we don't advocate on their individual behalf and we can't always give them the answers they're necessarily looking for. But I talk them through the steps and what I say to them is, were you given in induction and orientation, you know, a map of the organisation and, and a bit of a um, flow chart of who they can go to if they have concerns? Because what if their concern is with their direct supervisor? Um, then who do they go to um, and how do they, you know, as part of things like your grievance procedures. So, you know, reminding and reiterating that that support is an ongoing thing, um, that you want to create this great experience for them from the beginning, but you don't want it to stop there. You want it to continue um, and you want them to feel involved, part of the team, consulted with and know where they can access support. 
Anything else, David, before we move into our next section? Um, no, I think that's, that covers it well, unless there are any questions from the floor. So feel free to utilise the chat box, guys. Um, what we're going to do now is we've got a little bit of a section called Devil's Advocate. So because we have this experience um, in terms of what people often ask us and what um, our organisation does deal with, we're going to go through a set of questions now and then we're going to open it up to the floor as well um, if you have any other further questions. So, David, did you want to start with that one? Yes, Emily, I'd like to ask you a question. <laughs> and the question is, what if our new volunteers decide not to continue or they get a job after induction? Very good one, this is common. So people, as we mentioned, you have a budget, you've invested time and energy into recruiting this volunteer and you've gone through the induction and orientation process. Yes, it can be very frustrating, we acknowledge that. However, what we know, well, firstly, you should be excited that they've got a paid um, role because often that is what some people are looking for as part of their process and why they may have joined as a volunteer to start with. So you want to celebrate with them and congratulate them. And what we also say to people is rather than roll your eyes, sigh, you know, feel annoyed, you can do all that, absolutely. But look at it like... That person and that individual has still had a really positive experience with your organisation. Now, if they ring to let you know, look, sorry, it hasn't worked out for me at the moment. My schedule's too busy. I've got to pay to um, employment now. I can't do it. Don't leave a bit of taste in their mouth. Thank them for their energy and their efforts for choosing your organisation to volunteer with. Acknowledge that um, that's where they're at right now and remind them that they can come back to your organisation at any point. Because again, if they've had a positive experience and they're going to be out talking to friends and family, they're still going to be your advocate and your champion. So you want them to go, oh, you know, like I could, could didn't end up volunteering at Volunteering SA and NT, but they treated me really well and they said I could come back at any time. You know, great, you've left a really positive taste in their mouth. So. As frustrating as it can be, it's inevitable and it's part of our role. Just remember to, you know, vent and feel your frustrations behind the scene. But with the volunteer themselves, I think try and be as positive as possible um, and highlight that, you know, you're happy for them and you understand and, and you're demonstrating that compassion or empathy if it's been a challenging time for them as well. Anything, David, you'd like to add on that? Sorry, I'll just turn my mute off. Um, no, I think that, that covers it. It is a positive thing. It's part of the process. And we all understand that when we bring volunteers on board, that that, you know, is, a, is something that might happen. And um, as far as possible, we try and celebrate when volunteers get a job, particularly if, you know, we've been a, re a reference for them or a referee for them. That's a, I think that's a great achievement. Unfortunately, it means we have to go through the process of recruitment again. But yeah, it's part of the process of volunteering and, and um, we appreciate their efforts. Yeah, that's right. I've got a question for you now, David. Should, uh -huh. should new volunteers read all the policies and procedures in the one day? So, yeah, we have talked a little bit about that and I think the answer is no. They don't have to read all of the policies and procedures and it's really up to the organisation and the volunteer coordinators to decide which policies they do need to read on that first day. And I would go beyond just reading them because we know that people skim over things and maybe don't necessarily understand all the intricacies. If it's a policy that you really need to explain, then build some time into the day to do that. And it might be... Um, I don't know whether it's better after lunch or before lunch, but um, find an appropriate time in the day when you can do that. Um, we don't want the induction to be all about policies and procedures the whole day, but yeah, keep the essential ones and then maybe use something like that acknowledgement form to make sure that the other policies and procedures are, are followed up. Right, thanks. All right, I've got a question for you now, Emily. Um, should volunteers pay for their uniforms and when should they get them at induction or later? Yeah, good question. And we often get this one. Um, so if your organisation is expecting and it's mandatory that a volunteer wears a uniform, then the organisation should be covering this cost. 
Volunteers shouldn't have any out-of-pocket um, expenses in their volunteering role if this is required of them to do their volunteering. So some organisations will choose not to have uniforms because of this. Um, there are organisations that do have volunteers paying for them, but they they do it in ways where it's sort of like it's a choice um, and people can choose whether they do that. Now, um, people often ask as well, you know, when should we, if we're, because again, if you end up going through training, induction, orientation, and someone chooses to move on, um, do you want to necessarily give them a $50 t-shirt? Um, you may write into the agreement that they need to give it back if they um, no longer volunteer with the organisation. That also then minimises any risks that they're not wearing um, your branded logo out there when they're no longer representing your organisation. But also you might wait until you've gone through your three month review. We don't call it probation because we don't use any language that crosses into what could be deemed a paid role um, or paid language. So things like contracts, probation, they're not language we um, encourage people to use um, to avoid any confusion or potentially being at risk of any um, fair work um, issues. But you may look at doing it after, a, say, a three-month period and say, you know, um, we've got to this point. Um, we're both happy, you know, the volunteer's happy, they want to continue, you're happy with their performance and give them the T-shirt. Um, or it might be something you choose to do earlier on, but you just write that clause in there around um, that if they were no longer volunteering here, they do need to hand that back. Again, with name badges as well. Um, name badge, you need to um, have that ready to go on day one, I think, but you need to ask for those sorts of things back as well so that someone's not out there misrepresenting potentially your organisation. Thanks, David. Um, so, David, how do we let volunteers know about our COVID-19 safe practices? Yeah, this is a really important one, obviously, and particularly at the moment. Um, no doubt you'll have something on your website if you're an organisation about the COVID safe practices you are um, employing in, in the organisation, but really that's not quite enough for um, the induction of new volunteers because we have to make sure they've read that information, that they understand that information, um, and probably they need to have that information before they arrive at your, um, at your workplace. So uh, you send an email, here's the you know, the link or here's the information, can you please read it? Um, do you understand it? Uh, some organisations might think about it, infection control training as part of the process. Uh, be specific about what kind of things they'll need to do when they arrive at the organisation. You know, we're using sanitizer, we're doing uh, physical distancing in the office, so just keep that in mind when you're working with other people. Um, are there going to be masks available if they're required? So it needs to be something specific. It needs to be something uh, that is signed off on as well, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. And, mm. and of course, we encourage everyone to stay across in both South Australia and the Northern Territory. Any advice that's provided by the relevant health departments and also um, any decisions that are made around, um, you know, working from home, lockdown, whatever it might be, we're in a bit of a tricky sort of, you know, challenging time here in South Australia and the Northern Territory was definitely impacted by the lockdown as well. So, um, you know, try and stay up to date and make sure you access the information from the, the, the relevant sources and the correct sources and, and be sharing that information regularly with your volunteers. We, for example, we made a decision on, fr on Friday no, Monday that we went into working from home again and on that day we contacted all our volunteers ASAP as we did with the paid staff. So everyone got that information at the same time. So, um, you know, continue that communication, whether it's emailing, texting, phone calls, um, keep informing everyone about the COVID safe practices in your organisation. David, I think you're... Okay, Emily, uh, we have yeah. a question for you. <laughs> um, what if our new volunteers don't want to do all of our training? Absolutely um, a good question because this is not only relevant to new volunteers but maybe current and existing volunteers. 
I've had an organisation say to me, no, I've got guys here who've been working in this men's shed for 15 years and they're not going to do the training. Well, if this training is about compliance for your organisation with um, legislation and work health and safety practices, then you're going to need to encourage everyone to do it. So you need to sell it in a positive light. We don't want to buy into arguments or, you know, conversations about, yes, it's hard, you know, annoying, frustrating. It's part of the role. We just need to get on and do it. Um, we need to do it, otherwise we don't meet um, our funding obligations. We don't meet the requirements by law, you know, and unfortunately that if you can't do it and if you're really refusing to do it, then it's something that um, you may not be able to continue volunteering with us. Um, but what I think you do need to consider is how to make sure it's accessible to everyone. So. Um, if you've got people perhaps with some issues around accessibility, um, making sure that it's, you know, do they need to bring a carer along um, or is there a support person that might help them? If you've got um, volunteers that English is a second language, can you provide some of those resources translated into different languages or can you, you know, you might even look at having an interpreter. So to try and minimise, you know, and sometimes it's worth finding out, well, what is the barrier? You know, maybe it is having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with that volunteer to see what their frustrations are or what's preventing them from wanting to complete that training. And there might be ways for you to work with them um, individually to make sure that they can get through that because we want them to and we want them, you know, you've gone through this process today and you don't want to have to say, unfortunately, no. Um, but you know, talk to them, find out what some of their challenges are. It could be some literacy and numeracy issues. It might be that if it's technic, technology you know, online, they don't have access to that. So do what you can to make sure you're making sure it's inclusive and accessible for everyone, really important. Um, but there's some things that are non-negotiable. And I think, you know, in your role description, you need to state those things as well, that this is what is part of our expected in the role and, and this is what we have to do to meet legislation and be compliant. Um, you know, if it's something that's less, um, less serious in terms of what you're needing, there might be some ways to make it a bit more um, fun or enjoyable and try, and try and think about that. Offer a lunch, you know, provide morning tea make it in a, like, at a time that's convenient, offer a few different time slots. Um, sometimes you might need to run things out of hours because a lot of our volunteers work Monday to Friday or are caring for people and children. So try and be, yeah, accessible and think as much about how you can be inclusive to everyone that you're recruiting so that you can minimise any of those barriers as to why they might not be able to or not feel comfortable doing the training. Anything else, David, on that? No, I just think you know, um, setting those high expectations, you know, we do have a lot of training as part of this role and you, you know, you will be expected if they know that up front, that's a, a really good thing. And the other, you know, we mentioned before, promoting them as an opportunity, not as a, as a chore or something that that's right. needs to be endured, but something that can, you know, and maybe providing certificates and, and that kind of thing might be a, a way of rewarding and uh, useful for some volunteers too. Yeah, certificates definitely, especially for people for their resume. So that's a great idea. So our final question, should we induct, and we have talked a little bit about this, should we induct new volunteers as a group or individually? I think that it could be either a group or individually. And there's a few factors. One is uh, the time frame. So if you've got a group of volunteers being recruited and it's going to be another six weeks before you finish that recruitment process, and then another four weeks before induction, you might want to consider bringing them on board in stages. But if you can keep them together as a group, it's good because it builds the, that team, that team building stuff. Um, you know, if you have lunch together and do all the induction together, and then maybe some individual um, discussions with volunteers depending on their roles, say after lunch or uh, on the, on a separate day. So I don't think there's any really um, there's no one answer to that, but the group is always a great way to build a, build a team. And if you've got volunteers with similar or the same roles, that's a, that's a great way to do it. Absolutely, I agree. So before we open it up to questions, um, I just want to reiterate a couple of things. Um, 
Obviously, in today's we've really focused on um, induction and orientation. We will send through all the links to the resources we've shared and discussed. So we will email that. Um, you will either receive it tomorrow or early next week. Um, we will also be sending through an evaluation, which we ask people to complete, which really helps us in guiding our training um, as we're planning for 2021. Um, so that would be really useful if you're able to complete that and send that back. Um, and just a reminder um, that if you're a member of our organisation, you know, we do work with people one on one on some things as well. Um, and we do have a fee for service to help people develop some of these areas in their organisation a little bit more. But also for those of you that are Commonwealth Home Support funded, David can actually spend more time working with you on your programs as well. Um, so, um, yeah, just want to reiterate that before we open up to any questions around anything we've discussed today or we haven't discussed and that you'd like to know a bit more about. So you're welcome now to turn your cameras on, microphones on or use the chat box, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Um, Ricky, that was a great point you made about um, putting all of the policies and procedures in a volunteer handbook so that volunteers can access them at any time and get them to sign off on the really important ones. That's good. And with a volunteer handbook, um, it might be something you've actually given them prior to induction and orientation too. You might have given them um, that or you might choose to give that to them on the day as well. So that's something that's really useful to have. Um, if you don't already have one, I suggest looking into that. And you can utilise volunteers to help you make that um, a really effective resource. We found the volunteer handbook really good and I actually give them the volunteer handbook as part of their recruitment process, to be honest. Mm. Yeah. So I give it to them right up front. So the expectations are really clear. So when, when we actually, I'll do an inf, like an information call with them when they inquire first. And at the end of that, if I think they're suitable, if they're still interested, I say, look, you need to do, we use better impact. So you need to do an application on better impact. Um, and then I give them the handbook at that point. It's just a Dropbox PDF document and say, look, there's a lot of information in here. It talks about our background. What are the expectations of a volunteer? So right up front, before I even go into an interview with them, they know what's expected. And then I open up um, the opportunity to discuss any questions they've got actually at the interview as well. And then at the end, I say, do you, have you read the handbook? Do you have any questions? Is there anything you're not clear on? Because I don't even want to go to that recruitment part or go into the induction and training if they don't know. So I really create that expectations right up front. And then after the training, we, we reiterate it through the induction training. But then when I actually sign them on, I say to them, here's the handbook again. Did you read through? Shall we go through this? And then I get them to sign the volunteer agreement and the code of conduct before I place them. So um, I want it to be really clear, especially in the role that we've got, because it's very specific. Um, we do that really from the get go so that by the time they get to the end, they know exactly what's expected of them. So it's not even trainings, not questioned. I say to them, if you're going to be a part of this role, you're expected to do this training, that training. I need you to do all these checks. This is why we do this. This is why we're doing that. So they know up front, but we do it as part of the recruitment process. So I don't know if that's helpful to anybody. Sure. That's absolutely <laughs> definitely a useful way of doing it. Um, and there's no reason why you, like that wouldn't work. And it's great to set those expectations. So yeah, some people choose not to, to not overwhelm people um, so early on. But again, like you said, it's specific to the role. And if it's a very clear, role and it's a role that might carry a bit of responsibility it's really good to clarify those high expectations early on thanks ricky thanks for sharing any other questions or thoughts or anything anyone would like to share no well hopefully 
people have found um, today useful. Um, and again, come back to us with any questions if there's anything that you're unsure of or would like further clarification on or um, there's some great resources out there. The other thing or we should always say as well, there's no reason if your organisation has a lot of these, well, in our organisation actually, in all of our policies and procedures that exist for paid staff are applicable to volunteers. So you don't need to necessarily reinvent the wheel. So um, a volunteer handbook is definitely something obviously specific to volunteers, but utilise what you've already got in place for some of these policies and procedures and your induction checklist. Ours doesn't actually vary. Um, it only varies when we're talking about role specific duties. So don't um, necessarily go out there and start writing everything from scratch. Talk to those in your organisation that are relevant to get those resources um, and look at if they... What you might even do is what we ended up doing is using the term workforce and then the definition, definition of that is this includes paid staff and volunteers. So um, you can change the language in your current um, policies and procedures within the organisation as well. So, um, so that um, you're not having to get out there and you know create a whole lot of new work for yourself. And remember, keep consulting and chatting with volunteers and seeing if they're finding it, as David said, useful and relevant and some things might become outdated quite quickly. So you might need to update things as well. Great. So what we'll do, we'll send out the resources. Um, we've also recorded this, so we'll send you through the link as well. Um, and you'll have, I'll include, we'll include in that both mine and David's email. So if you've got any questions or you're a CHISP um, provider and want to chat with David more about how he can support you, you're welcome to. Um, and we'll go from there. But um, thank you everyone for joining us today in a really crazy time that we're living in at the moment. This is our official last training before the end of the year. We've actually got a new series we've created called um, Volunteering Into the Future, a conversation with, um, and yesterday we held our first one, not sure if anyone attended with um, Evelyn O'Loughlin, our CEO, but we are looking to do another one on the 9th of December. We haven't got the um, guest speaker confirmed yet, but we're trying to really tap into experts from the sector um, to provide relevant information um, that's you know, useful for us in this ever-changing time. So um, please keep an eye out. And of course, we'll be looking at our training for next year. And I strongly encourage you, if you're in Alice or the NT, you know, tap into Belinda that's here with us today. Um, she'll be working with you guys there. and join one of our networks here in South Australia as well. And um, don't, don't be afraid to sing out and, you know, or tell us your issues as well. So we can always feed that back to our CEO for the, for the um, government and for the relevant people to be aware of. David, anything to add? No, just, uh, yeah, keep in touch. Thanks very much. Um, and uh, I hope you found it informative and useful. Great. Well, take care, everyone. Stay safe and look after yourselves and keep cool in both SA and NC with these big waves. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, really David, so much. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.